I stopped by just to tell you I love you. And since you're not at home, I'm writing it to you. Elena Poniatowska, El Recado. Hello again. Let's continue analyzing Cervantes's masterpiece. The scene is a dark repetition of the encounter with Merlin and Dulcinea, two men dressed in mourning, beating two giant drums, also covered in black, with a man playing a flute as pitch black as all the rest. Finally, there arrives a personage of gigantic proportions, cloaked with a jet black robe. He was crossed and girded by a wide sword belt, also black, from which hung an enormous scimitar with a sheath and other touches, all in black, his face covered by a black transparent veil. This man is the essence of blackness, and his single contrasting detail is a lengthy beard, white as snow. The narrator underscores this feature, the most horrific, the longest, the whitest, and the densest beard that human eyes had ever seen. The beard even explains his name, Trifaldin of the White Beard. So the beard is clearly a symbol. I see a reference to racial politics here, but there must be more to it than that. Recall Sancho's horrified reaction to the humiliation of Don Quixote when the Duke's servants washed his beard in chapter 32. The novel now takes a political and international turn. The man is an ambassador of the Countess Trifaldi, also known as the Suffering Duena, from the mythical oriental kingdom of Candaya. He seeks Don Quixote's help. Don Quixote offers his assistance defending for the umpteenth time the errant knights against all those men of letters, ecclesiastics, and courtly knights who are corrupt and useless when it comes to saving the world. Did you know the Spanish Empire was the first to span five continents? This chivalric fantasy recalls those told by Don Quixote as well as those of the Princess of Micomicon in part one and the enchanted Dulcinea in part two. Note also that Don Quixote deploys another of his phallic catchphrases, except this time he qualifies it with oddly commercial language that means something like, I will expedite her commission by the force of my arm. In other words, it's another case of chivalric aristocracy descending into the bourgeois world. Chapter 37 continues the adventure of the Countess Trifaldi. First, we have the egocentric intervention by Sancho, who is more worried about his future government than the fate of Trifaldi. I wouldn't want for this lady duena to place any obstacle before my promised governorship. The squire then introduces an anecdote that links both topics, governing and women, to medicine. He recalls a Toledan apothecary who spoke like a goldfinch sings. As a source of Sancho's misogynistic thinking, the apothecary said that if duenas were involved, nothing good could come of it. This makes for an ironic contrast with Sancho's dependence on the Duchess and his concerned letter to Teresa. Again, it's important to remember that classical political thinking constantly appeals to medicine, linking the health of the state to the health of the properly educated leader. Cervantes's innovation here is to link political sickness, specifically violence, hubris, and corruption, to misogyny. Quixotic mission. Which colors do we principally associate with Rifaldin? A, light brown and blonde, B, yellow and silver, C, black and white. Correct answer, C, black and white. Don Quixote upbraids his squire sounding feminist, silence Sancho, my friend, and insisting that he should respect women in need, especially countesses, queens, and empresses. Underscoring tension between the sexes, Doña Rodriguez enters the argument, defending and identifying with the dueñas whom Sancho mocks. Notice the complexity here. Rodriguez criticizes the capriciousness of kings and then relates the danger of misogyny to the act of shearing beards. My lady, the Duchess, has dueñas in her service who could be countesses if fortune so desired, but laws follow kings, not vice versa, and whoever cut us down to size still has his scissors with him. This is a critique 
of the lawless male chauvinism of abusive men like Henry VIII of England. It is a figurative Catholic defense of the marriage contract as the antidote to hypermasculine tyranny, a major aspect of the Counter-Reformation's criticism of Protestantism. Sancho clings to his misogyny, citing his own barber's opinion that women need serious trimming. This is the famous woman question, known in French as la querelle des femmes, a debate popular in the salon culture of Italy, Spain, and France. Cervantes invents a term for it, the colloquy on duenas. Like the powerful Medici women at early modern courts, both Doña Rodriguez and the Duchess defend the virtue of women. According to Rodriguez, squires are our eternal enemies. She adds in very cultured language that she would send all these squires to the mobile logs. That is, she would sentence them to row in the galleys. The Duchess agrees. I believe that my good Doña Rodriguez is correct, and very much so. She adds that it's important to refute the evil opinion of that apothecary and to uproot the one that the great Sancho Panza has in his heart. Thank you for joining me in this chapter. Hope you can join me again in the next. Don't miss out on the adventures of the ingenious gentleman Don Quixote de la Mancha. To enroll in the course, click on the novel. To subscribe to our YouTube channel, click on Don Quixote. To watch more videos, click on Dulcinea. And to follow us on our social media, click on Sancho Panza.